Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation entitled Granular Activated Carbon, a Proven Solution for PFC Removal. My name is Rich Minna. I'm the Director of the Business Innovation Group here at Calgon Carbon, and joining me today to help give this presentation is Eric Forrester. Thanks, Rich. Once again, my name is Eric Forrester, and I am a Municipal Applications Engineer with uh, Calgon Carbon. So just to quickly give you an introduction to who Calgon Carbon is, uh, we have long been and continue to be the world's largest producer of granular activated carbon. And as many of you know, since activated carbon finds many um, environmental and purification uses, our mission statement sums that up. It is pure water, clean air, better living. We solve purification and separation problems with a wide array of technologies, including, of course, activated carbon of a number of different kinds, from coal, coconuts, and wood, for example, as well as with other technologies, including ion exchange, UV, advanced oxidation processes, perlites, and diatomaceous earths. Water treatment is certainly a core competency for us, uh, but we do like to brag there are many hundreds of different applications for activated carbon. To give you a feel for our size, our 2015 net sales were $535 million. Uh, we have over 70 years' experience in the manufacture and application of activated carbon, employing over 1,400 people across 23 different offices and 21 manufacturing facilities scattered across the globe, and we currently hold over 240 patents. So let's get on to talking about protecting communities from perfluorinated compounds. PFC is a generic uh, abbreviation that stands for perfluorinated compounds. Here you see two of those represented, namely PFOA and PFOS. Uh, these are the two that you'll hear of most often when it comes to PFCs. One reason for that is because these are the two that found the, the greatest use before their manufacture and use was banned. But another big reason you're hearing a lot about these lately is that the EPA in 2016, back in April, very recently issued a new health advisory that stated that uh, the combined concentration of these two compounds should not exceed 70 parts per trillion in drinking water. Now, this is not the sort of regulation that requires um, municipalities to take any action, but it does guide uh, municipal water authorities to test drinking water and to report if they find these compounds in the water. Why are they a problem? Uh, they've been showing up all over the place in food and water, and the very properties that make them attractive for various applications, that is their stability and such, is also what causes them to be a problem in the environment. Because they're so stable, they're less likely to break down by natural or biological processes. And we are incre increasingly finding that they tend to accumulate in the body. There, they can cause a wide variety of problems. They're thought to be precancerous, uh, as well as um, causing developmental problems. Why are these showing up all over the place? Well, they've found application in a wide variety of uses. These uh, pictures at the bottom just give you a, a feel for some of those. Uh, one of the big ones was for aqueous film-forming foams used for fighting fires. Uh, perfluorinated chemistries also got widely applied in cookware, of course. You find them in uh, high-performance clothing, food packaging, and uh, not babies in the picture here, but rather the, the carpet that the baby's lying on. Um, these uh, were used widely for the purpose of uh, stain prevention. Where are they turning up? This map shows you uh, different parts of the country where uh, drinking water authorities authorities have been detecting these compounds. According to the US EPA, to date, at least 94 public drinking water systems are detecting PFCs in the water across 28 different states that are highlighted in red on this map. And this, in turn, affects at least six and a, six and a half million Americans. And keep in mind, this does not include private wells that are not being tested. Also, non-drinking water sources that might contain PSEs are not included in this currently. And of course, as more and more people discover these things, the problem only continues to grow. In addition to drinking water sites, these things are also showing up in potentially contaminated de Department of Defense sites. Uh, again, those firefighting foams I mentioned are largely the culprit here in this case. To our knowledge, currently, the Department of Defense has identified over 200 bases that are potentially contaminated, and this is across all 50 states, hence the map is entirely red. Testing is currently underway at many of these sites, 
And unfortunately, because these things spread so readily through groundwater plumes, these may in turn impact adjacent municipal water utilities. So how can GAC help? First of all, I'd like to point out some of the economic benefits of GAC. If you consider first that the average family of four consumes about 65,700 gallons of water annually, and then that the addition of GAC to water treatment adds just roughly $2 a month to treatment costs for your average family of four per the American Water Works Association. Consider also then that the average 2015 price for bottled water was $1.22 a gallon. If that same family relied on bottled water for just half their water intake, you can see that that water bill would quickly add up to many thousands as compared to just adding $24 per year to have GAC added. GAC is most certainly a proven technology for many compounds and in particular for PFCs. Um, currently it is the leading and go-to choice for PFC treatment. Why is that? Well, it was established well over 15 years ago by now that it does do a very effective job of removing these compounds from water and to date there are over 20 large installations in both municipal and industrial segments as well as over a thousand POET or point of entry treatment systems that are treating residential wells. GAC, we feel, is a safe and environmentally responsible way to treat these contaminants uh, as compared to chemistries that might try to break down these compounds that also might add other toxic compounds to the water. This simply locks up the contaminants like a sponge. GAC has been proven for many years to be cost effective and meanwhile will simultaneously remove many other emerging contaminants from drinking water which can help address other future compliance requirements. And finally, as I mentioned, GAC does trap the contaminants. It doesn't make them magically disappear, of course, but thanks to a well-established process known as the reactivation of spent carbon, that spent carbon, once it's used up, can be pulled out of the vessel, taken back to a facility where it's thermally treated, where that thermal treatment then drives off the compounds, breaks down those PFC compounds, thereby eliminating any liability for the customer. And once that's done, then the regenerated carbon or reactivated carbon can be returned to the customer, put back into the vessel, and used once again. As I mentioned, there are at least uh, there are over 20 installations. This map just gives you a feel for where those are. As you can see, currently these pegs are largely on the eastern half of the country. I think that has to do a lot with where the manufacturer of these compounds has taken place historically. But uh, I would say that uh, as the Department of Defense begins to uh, implement treatment, uh, you'll start to see more pegs scattered across the country on this map. So why is the Filtrasorb brand of GAC superior? Filtrasorb is a, produced from domestically mined coals, and it's a carbon that's domestically manufactured here in the United States. Specifically, we employ bituminous coals, and we, process, we employ a process called reagglomeration. Bituminous coal-based reagglomerated GAC has been shown to have better performance in water applications as compared to direct activated coal carbons and coconut-based carbons. To help give you a feel for what I'm talking about as far as these processes, I have a couple process diagrams to go through. In direct activation, this covers materials like coconuts, wood, or lignite coals, for example. One can simply take that starting material, crush it down. You may or may not have a simple baking step, and then you can go straight into your activator, make the activated carbon. Afterward, you simply screen, and you have your finished product. Uh, in contrast to that, in the reagglomeration process that we practice, we take a blend of coals, we pulverize it, and then kind of glue it back together in a step we call agglomeration, only to crush it again. Of course, this all sounds rather counterintuitive, but there's a good reason for doing that, which I'll get into on the next slide. Obviously, this also requires extra equipment. From there, we go into a very highly controlled baking step, and finally into the activator, and then screening and finished product. So again, why do we practice this reagglomeration step? Why do we add all this extra equipment up front with all the uh, extra processing that would add cost. That is, of course, because it produces a superior product. One reason for that is this helps us get more even activation. That gluing back together step includes pitch, and when we glue it back together, 
this creates artificially a series of larger pores that we call transport pores. And thanks to those transport pores, when we go through our baking and then our activation steps, the volatile matter contained in the starting material coal can get out more easily. And then later on in the activation process, the activation gases can go in through those pores and start to chew away and create the holes inside the carbon. And therefore, we feel we get a much more even activation throughout the particle. By contrast, if we were to practice direct activation without that agglomeration step, we would lack that transport pore structure. VM would not get out. The activating gases would not get in as well. And what you would wind up with is a much less even activation of the granule. You would have an outer skin that would be overactivated uh, and would be fairly brittle. And meanwhile, in the center, you would have almost no activation at all. In fact, these things would turn into coke and become uh, completely inert. I want to talk again about the starting materials one can use to make activated carbon. Here you see pictured the four main ones used in the industry, namely wood, lignite, or brown coals, bituminous coals, and coconut shells. The choice of starting material will have a profound impact on the ultimate finished product in a variety of ways. For instance, it di dictates the kind of ash that you're going to have, but one other important factor is that it dictates the sort of pore structure that you're going to have. And this, again, gets to why we feel the filter sort product is superior for these water treatment applications. Here we have a, a very simplified depiction of the pore structure that you can find in the carbons produced from these various starting materials. If you look first at the wood, you'll see that you tend to have plates that are smaller, and the gaps in between those plates tend to be bigger as compared to the other carbons. What this means is, you have a much more wide open pore structure. Um, you have good kinetics, but you might have less capacity for some of the harder to remove contaminants because you have less of those smaller pockets for them to, to wind up in. Then as we step through the other starting materials, for example, if we then look at lignite, we see now we're starting to add more plates, a little bit more of the smaller pores. Then we step to bituminous coal. Now you see we're getting a lot tighter. A lot of those close together plates that are creating those higher energy adsorption pores that do a better job of holding on to trace contaminants. However, you still have some of these larger uh, transport pores that I mentioned. And then finally, if you look at coconut carbon, you can see that has the highest of all, um, the highest density of the micro pores, the higher energy pores, but it lacks a lot of the transport pore structure that we feel is necessary to deal with real world waters to contain. Um, all the time they contain a certain amount of background organic contaminants. These tend to be large molecules that can ultimately blind a carbon if it doesn't have the right sort of balance of transport pore structure and micropores to handle those. And so with that, I think I'm going to hand things off to Eric here. Thank you, Rich. Now that Rich has done a great job setting the scene, talking about what perfluorinated compounds are, why they're an issue, and a little bit about GAC, how it's made, and why it's been used so widely for this application. I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of testing and testing activated carbon to, to show you exactly why and how it removes these compounds effectively. And so PFCs or PFASs are found in drinking water in trace amounts. And for that reason, we always recommend testing with a, a raw water sample of whatever the source water that's going to be treated. Now, when I talk about testing, really the bench scale tests that I'm talking about come in two different flavors. One is known as the isotherm test, and one is, the, one is also known as the accelerated column test. The isotherm test is, uh, is a quick test method that's really used for feasibility. Is this activated carbon going to work for this application, or is it not? Now the accelerated column test, on the other hand, it gets a little bit more detailed. It simulates the full-scale performance of an actual system, and it provides a lot of important information, such as what carbon type is going to be the best type for this application, how quickly is this contaminant going to get through my carbon bed, and how often am I going to need to exchange this carbon bed. And so this, play, this plays an important role in designing a system, and it can help tell you is my system going to be large enough? Can I make this a little bit smaller to optimize on an economic scale? So for drinking water applications, P 
PFCs typically occur in very, very low concentrations, as we had said earlier, in the PPB and most often in the PPT range, parts per billion and parts per trillion. Now, the background organics, also known as TOC, total organic carbon, can be, 100, can be 10 to 100, even 1,000 times higher than the PFC or PFAS concentration in the water. And so because of that, because of such the big disparity between the background organic concentration and the perfluorinated compound concentration, modeling this scenario without testing is very, very difficult, even for other applications that aren't with non-PFC compounds. And so that's why using an ACT or an RSSCT test is beneficial. But sometimes timing doesn't permit the luxury of testing. Sometimes you need to get a system online immediately to, to protect public uh, protect the public health interest. And so at a minimum, what Calgon Carbon would recommend is 10 minutes of empty bed contact time per adsorber with two different adsorbers in series. That means the water would flow through one absorber, come out the end, and then start flowing directly into the second adsorber and then go through to the clear well or distribution system. And so a little bit more of a description on that isotherm test. Let's get a, get a better idea of exactly what it is. And really what the isotherm test is, it's about 11 100 milliliter vials of solution. And you leave one, one of those vials empty, and then in the other 10, you dose increasing amounts of activated carbon. And as you can see in the visual, as you dose more activated carbon and you let that, let that solution come to equilibrium with the carbon, less and less residual PFC is going to be left in that solution. And so after, we, after that uh, solution has reached equilib equilibrium, we filter out that activated carbon and measure how much of those PFCs are left in each of those vials. And with that, we can plot those residual concentrations to get an idea of the loading or how many milligrams of PFC can load per gram of activated carbon. And from that, we can get an idea of a rough carbon usage rate, how many pounds of activated carbon are going to be used per thousand gallons treated. Now on the flip side of that is the RSSCT or ACT test method. And what that stands for is RSSCT stands for Rapid Small Scale Column Test. ACT stands for Accelerated Column Test. You'll hear both of these test methods thrown around in the industry, but they're really the same type of test. And what it is, it's a very, a very small column with a high pressure pump that pumps the solution or the water to be treated through a very scaled down activated carbon column, about a quarter inch outer diameter column made of 316 stainless steel. And what this does is it allows us to simulate the actual empty bed contact time and linear velocity that you would see in a proposed full scale system. And so in contrast to the isotherm test, which is used mainly just to see is this activated carbon going to pick up this compound or is it not? This allows you to design your full-scale system and see in a very short period of time how effective it's going to be. And when I say a short period of time, what I mean is that very generally, when we, uh, when we want to simulate one year of full-scale operation, we can accomplish that in the lab in about three weeks. And so this is a great way to get, some, get data to see how a full-scale system would perform in a very, very short time frame. And so, similarly to the data plot that I had showed you with the isotherm earlier, I'm going to show you a couple of plots that demonstrate some results of an RSSCT test. Now, this RSSCT meant to, was meant to compare three different activated carbon types, two coconut carbon types, and one of the virgin filtersorb bituminous coal uh, carbon that we were discussing just a little bit earlier. And so, what this shows is this simulated a 10-minute empty bed contact time with an influent concentration of PFOA of about 900 parts per trillion. And what you can see here is that the coconut carbons show breakthrough almost instantaneously, and it rapidly approaches the influent concentration after only a few thousand bed volumes. In contrast, the filtersorb product, it stays non-detect or below 2 nanograms per liter, 2 ppt, for nearly 10,000 bed volumes, and only reaches that 70 part per trillion health advisory after 20,000 bed volumes. And now you'll see a similar trend with the PFOS breakthrough. Now this, again, shows 10 minutes of empty bed contact time. It's that same water that we just saw on the previous graph, but this had about 800 ppt of PFOS. 
but you see a very similar trend, that the coconut carbons break through nearly instantaneously and very quickly get back to that influent concentration. But the filters orb keeps that PFOS non-detect for several tens of thousands of bed volumes and only reaches that 70 part per trillion health advisory limit after about 20,000 bed volumes or more. Now another line that's important to note on this graph and the previous graph is there's a 50% there's a 50% level of that influent concentration. And so it's important to note when those carbons reach that 50% level because in addition to that 10 minute of empty bed contact time with two adsorbers in series, we would recommend exchanging exchanging that lead bed, that first vessel in that two vessel system once the effluent from that vessel reaches 50% of that influent concentration. And the reason for that is, is it allows for maximum carbon loading or maximum utilization in that lead bed, while at the same time you have that, that second bed or that lag vessel online to catch whatever is coming through the lead vessel. So it allows you to get maximum carbon utilization while still providing full compliance and keeping non-detect and below that 70 part per trillion health advisory limit on the system as a whole. So what can we get from that, from that little snippet of analysis? What kind of conclusions can we draw? What we saw clearly was that the bituminous coal-based re-agglomerated GAC clearly outperforms the coconut-based GAC. Now there are several reasons that we believe that occurred, but the, the primary one is that as Rich noted with the, the structure, the carbon platelet structure that he showed earlier, is that the coconut has a very tight structure. So it has lots of micropores that hold things very, very strongly but it doesn't have very many transport pores. And since the PFOA and PFOS molecules are long-chained compounds and relatively bulky from a, a structure standpoint, the transport pore structure of the coconut was inadequate to handle them and absorb them in the contact time that was provided. Whereas the bituminous coal carbon, through the reagglomeration process, had many more transport pores and was able to absorb those contaminants very, very effectively. And so lab analysis shows that the bituminous coal product, specifically re-agglomerated bituminous coal, is the best available product out there for PFC removal. And you might be saying, well, that's just one data set. But what we have here in this next few slides is a case study specific to a customer. And so in this first set of data, we performed an isotherm for this customer, looking at both PFC removal, total PFC removal, as well as TOC removal. And what we're going to see here is that with this PFOA at an influent level of 550 parts per trillion, this uh, isotherm shows that we'd get a, a carbon usage rate on the order of 0.04 pounds, pounds of GAC used for every 1,000 gallons treated. In contrast, when we look at the TOC removal, the TOC isotherm, at about 1.38 parts per million, the carbon usage rate is nearly an order of magnitude higher at 0.2 pounds of GAC per thousand gallons treated. And so what that tells us is that the PFCs are preferentially adsorbed compared to the TOC, that they want to stick to the carbon more than those TOC molecules do. And so after these isotherm tests, we also ran an accelerated column test to simulate their full scale system. And this graph further supports the fact that the TOC is not adsor adsorbed and held as well as the PFCs do. So what you can see here is that the influent PFOA level is somewhere between 400 and 300 parts per trillion coming into that small scale column, car carbon column. And the TOC here is about 0.8 parts per million coming into that carbon column. And you can see that all of those PFCs, that some of the trace amounts of the smaller compounds even, as well as the, the main constituent PFOA, remain non-detect or below two nanograms per liter for 620 simulated days, nearly two years of simulated operation, whereas the TOC starts to break through after about 125 days. And so, a few conclusions from that case study. Is that again, this FilterZorb product can remove PFCs to non-detectable levels down below two nanograms per liter or two PPT. TOC does not appear to compete very strongly with PFCs, especially at those concentrations, even though it is several several hundred times more than the background than the PFC concentrations, it breaks through significantly sooner than the PFC compounds. 
and in this case, Filters Orb was effective for more than 620 simulated days of operation. There was no breakthrough of the compound in that 620 days, let alone reaching the 70 part per trillion health advisory. And so as a result of this testing, the client decided to, as a temporary solution, um, install two 10-foot diameter vessels with 20,000 pounds of GAC in each one. That was placed online in March of 2016 and was operating through December of 2016. And in December of 2016, the client decided to install and went ahead with their full-scale design, their permanent system, with two 12-foot diameter vessels, each containing 40,000 pounds of GAC each. And it's important to note that the temporary system throughout its, ent its entire duration did not have detection on the effluent of that two-vessel system for any PFCs. And so I had I'd started to allude to what type of equipment can be used for PFCs and their removal. And so at Calgon Carbon has several base options or several standard options that we can provide in various sizes that are then customized for a specific customer's requirements. Specifically, the Model 8 system. These are two two eight-foot diameter vessels, each one containing 10,000 pounds of carbon. Up to the Model 10, which is a 10-foot diameter system with each vessel containing 20,000 pounds of activated carbon. The Model 12 system has a 12 foot, two 12-foot diameter vessels. These also contain 20,000 pounds of carbon in each vessel. These are sometimes used ideally for situations where a low profile is needed, such as a size-constrained building or some place that would not be aesthetically pleasing. On the flip side, the Model 1240 system is, again, two 12-foot diameter vessels, but these each hold 40,000 pounds of activated carbon. And then the largest system is Model 14s. These are 14-foot diameter vessels that each can contain 60,000 pounds of carbon. These typically come as a single vessel, but a pipe rack can be fitted onto these to come as a two-vessel system to be uh, ideal for PFC removal. Now, once you have that GAC fully loaded up with perfluorinated compounds, the question becomes, what do you do with that? Because you obviously don't want to dispose of this in a landfill and have those PFCs leach back off and begin to contribute to the problem again. And so. What carbon reactivation is, generally, is it's uh, you pull the carbon, the spent carbon, out of a, an adsorptive system, bring it back to, its, uh, to a reactivation facility, heat the carbon up again through another thermal process. It removes those adsorbed chemical constituents, and they're burned up uh, through that thermal process. The reactivated carbon is placed back in a truck, and that truck drives the activated carbon and is placed back into service. And so, now those chemicals that got removed during that thermal process, they are thermally destroyed. They're broken, da broken down to their elemental constituents, so they are not, not in a harmful form. The carbon, like I said, is then reusable. It can be placed back in those vessels to continue removing those perfluorinated compounds. And the frequency of activation, of course, is dependent on the application. But as we just saw, Virgin activated carbon can be used for nearly two years uh, when a system is designed properly to continue to remove those PFCs. So relative to other activated carbon applications for municipal drinking water, PFCs have, have a relatively long service life between reactivation cycles. Now GAC isn't the only game in town to remove these constituents. Specifically, there are three big players in, in removal technologies for PFCs. The first, obviously, is granular activated carbon, which we have just discussed in detail. Some of the pros to activated carbon is that it typically has very low capital and operation costs. Another advantage is that reactivation. The reactivated product tends to cost f fractions of what the virgin cost carbon costs, and so that saves costs there with reactivation. It destroys those PSCs and removes the li li liability of those compounds. In addition, you also get simultaneous removal of other organics, because GAC is already an established best available, best available treatment technology for a very long list of organic contaminants. And so, at the same time, if you already have GAC online for disinfection byproduct or TOC removal or VOC removal, and you find out that you have a PFC issue, 
the GAC is already acting to remove all of those compounds at the same time. Now the big con to GAC is that when you have a bunch of other constituents present and the, concentra the total concentration that it needs to treat goes up, that usage rate tends to increase. The next big treatment technology for PFC removal is reverse osmosis. And the big advantage here is that it can, rem it can remove salts and inorganics that GAC doesn't. But some of the big cons to this uh, technology is that there, you tend to have a very highly concentrated wastewater, generally about 10% of whatever your flow rate is, you have to dispose of as a highly concentrated waste. Now the third player here is ion exchange. And so some of the pros to ion exchange is very similar to GAC. The resin can be regenerated the same way that GAC can be reactivated. And so depending on what other constituents are in the water, if there's something that GAC can't handle, for example, nitrate, ion exchange may be a more economical solution. But some of the cons is that ion exchange resin tends to be very expensive. And if you need to regenerate that resin, you have to, that's typically done through a, a brine or a methanol solution, and you have to have a way to dispose of that, of that waste solution. And so what's Calgon Carbon's big advantage in this PFC removal market? Well, Calgon Carbon's been offering the preferred solution, granular activated carbon, for, a, for more than 15 years with the Filtersorb product line. So we have experience doing this, and we know that we have the best product available to, to treat these compounds. GAC is the leading technology for the removal of PFCs. Now, Calgon Carbon is also ready to respond immediately with technical services, equipment, and carbon supply, all the way from field service to corporate troubleshooting. Now, the spent carbon can be returned to Calgon Carbon for reactivation and thermally destroying those PFCs so that you don't have any future liability and we don't have to dispose of the activated carbon in a landfill and just start the process over again. So Calgon Carbon, what do we do? We offer, we provide a proven and cost-effective packaged solution. We can perform laboratory and field testing to see exactly what we need to do to make sure that the system is effective for removing these compounds. We ensure that the, the system design that we propose is appropriately designed and is going to work. We can also deploy temporary treatment systems as, a, as an interim solution so that we can properly take the time and design the permanent system so that it can last and be the most economical solution possible. We have experienced sales, field service, and applications engineering teams to ensure that you're getting the, the best service in the business. We also have, as we said, carbon reactivation service so that you can reduce cost and reduce liability and danger of those PFC compounds. So at this time, I'd like to, that concludes our presentation. I'd like to take time for some questions. And that concludes the presentation portion of today's webinar. We have received a number of questions through the course of the presentation. Unfortunately, we won't be able to answer every question during the allotted time. We have selected three questions that appear to be recurring, which Rich and Eric can answer now. We will respond to the remainder of the questions through a follow-up email within the next 24 hours. If you have additional questions, please feel free to email pfcsolutions at calgoncarbon.com. The first question is, recently there has been a lot of research on the use of ion exchange resins. Can you comment on why a site or utility would select one technology over another? Yeah, this is Rich. Um, you know, definitely ion exchange, as far as it goes for PFC removal, um, we have yet to see this gain broad adoption in the marketplace. Uh, it seems to be the sort of technology that is still very much in the piloting phase. Uh, however, that said, I, I think there are or can be certain circumstances where ion exchange would be the, the superior choice. Uh, for example, if you imagine you have an influence stream with extremely high concentrations of PFCs, say PPM versus PPT, uh, there the, the higher capacity of a resin might make sense. Also, for example, uh, even Calgon Carbon recently supplied equipment uh, for ion exchange to be used at a site in Colorado. 
there in that case, they w there was another particular contaminant in the water uh, that the resin was better suited for. So in that one particular case, it was more economical to uh, utilize resin. And then finally, I'd like to point out that you know Calgon has its own line of uh, ion exchange products called CalRes uh, that we are also uh, working to optimize, and we're currently conducting a lot of testing on this. Uh, at the moment, though, uh, there's not a lot of information out there, and uh, I guess I would just conclude by saying we always recommend testing uh, whether it's GAC or ion exchange. Uh, every water is going to be different. Okay, thank you, Rich. And the second question is, what happens to the PFOA or PFOS molecule after it is, it is adsorbed? This is Eric. And so, as we had illustrated with our data, those PFOA and PSO, PFOS molecules are adsorbed to the activated carbon structure, and so they are stuck in place on that activated carbon. So the molecule sits on that carbon surface until the carbon is taken out, out of service or out of its... Uh, out of its treatment system. But then once that carbon is reactivated and goes through that thermal process, those PFOA molecules are volatized off of that carbon structure, so they are no longer sticking to the activated carbon. And then as they go through that thermal process and the temperature increases, those molecules are broken down to their elemental forms and removed in the, the off-gas scrubber so that they don't get back out into the environment through this reactivation process. So they are they are completely destroyed and broken down into their elemental species once they go through that reactivation process. All right, and the final question for today's webinar is, there's a list of about 15 or so PSCs. Your data, data is focused primarily on C8s. How does GAC work with these smaller molecules? Do you have any data on smaller chain PSCs, i.e. C5, C6, uh, molecules, etc. This is Rich again. You know, today's webinar did focus primarily on the C8 compounds. Um, for one, that's because those are the two compounds that are called out in the EPA Health Advisory. Uh, currently, the, there are no smaller chain compounds included in the Health Advisory limits. Uh, also, the, it's not clear that those small chain compounds ever would be added because they uh, they don't accumulate in the body and stay in the body for as, as long as compared to the C8 compounds. That said, though, uh, my team is actually in the beginning stages of collecting some test data on these smaller chain PFCs. It's uh, It's clear that they work a little bit less well as you get smaller and smaller relative to the C8 compounds. However, we're seeing some initial results that uh, give us confidence that GAC is still going to be uh, the most economical alternative for most of these situations, even if you are trying to remove these shorter chain compounds. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some additional information on this very topic that we can share with you in the next few months. Okay. That concludes the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Thank you to everyone for your attention. I hope that you found today's webinar informative. Have a great day, and feel free to contact us should you have any additional questions. Thank you again.